Okay, welcome everybody. Tonight is the 13th of April. This is Dallas Personal Robotics Group Robot Nights Virtual. We're getting excited because uh, we're getting close to the time when we're going to have a mix of uh, virtual and uh, in person again. But for now, we're still virtual. My name's Carl Ott. I'm the current president of the club. And we're going to do the usual that we do on Tuesday nights, uh, which is to walk around the table and see what people have to share related to their robot builds and whatnot. Um, sort of their floats their fancy. So feel free to ask your questions. And uh, at some point, uh, we have a new visitor with a segue. And I'm, I'm sure that's going to spawn some really great discussion if you've got any challenges or things you'd like to share about that. So uh, with that in mind, we'll kick off with our, uh, our, our guaranteed uh, reliable opener. So Doug, what do you have to share tonight? Well, I've been working on my telepresence robot and I'm gonna see if I can point this camera at my current setup. Not sure if that's showing my robot car like device, but it should be. So. I put the pie on top of there with a rubber band because it's strictly a proof of concept. My uh, pie camera is just dangling here, so it's going to be crappy. I actually broke it about half an hour ago and it managed to push it back together. So I'm hoping that my demo will work. So I'm going to take over the stream. And let's see. We should be coming up on my uh, remote screen to my robot. Yep, looks good. You Can you maybe hide the uh, sharing thing for the Google Meet? Yes. Perfect, thanks. Okay, so what I've got here is my Raspberry Pi camera is upside down and dangling, so it's going to be crappy. It's also falling apart. Hopefully, it'll make it through the demo. And I've got my control module here. And I can go forward. Oops. I thought I could. Did I not turn it on? It worked a minute ago. Demo effect. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Well, that's interesting. I wonder what could be the deal. Everything is plugged in. Let's uh, try restarting this deal. The cool thing is you didn't even have to throw a softball at it. I know. Ah. <laughs> but does, does it do anything fun with beer? It yeah. does not. It will. Uh -huh. Let me get this back out of the way. Because right now I don't have the camera as part of the deal. Ah. Oh, well, you see it jerking forward, and it uh, responds to the button clicks, so it has basic functionality. If the camera was locked down, it wouldn't be nearly so jerky, and if it was right side up, it would be easier to see what the heck is going on. But as a proof of concept, I'm pretty excited to have gotten this far, <laughs> because I was having a lot of trouble with my serial to serial connection. So right now, just the forward, back, left, and right is working. And uh, I'm opening the discussion for questions now. Did, did you ever finish your little write-up for uh, doing all that? Uh, you know, I did not. I posted most of the write-up in the chat last time. And I'll be making a blog post with the entire write-up and forwarding that to uh, the club for posting on their website. Okay, cool. I've been really busy and I'm expecting to be busy this week too because tax time has come in even though they, they've given us an extension I always like to get done on time and I haven't started yet. So <laughs> I've been putting it off while I was doing this. Yeah, basically about a month, I think, if I remember yeah. right. <laughs> so basically so I've written this Thani program here, not, not Thani, Thani's the editor. I've written a Tinker program that has buttons on it that and uh, can do various things. None of this is wired up yet, 
but uh, eventually it can all be wired up and then hopefully it would control the robot. This camera is meant to be so the driver can see what they're going on and then the telepresence part of it will be provided by a, an attached, uh, probably a telephone or a tablet that's running Skype or something like that. So is this in Python or what languages slash are you using? Uh, this here is a Python program, which is right there. And I, I will be posting all of this on my blog post when I do it. And then the, the, uh, the robot actually is running an Arduino script that handles the motor controls. These, all these X's around the side here are meant to be distance measurements for object avoidance. There is no object avoidance on my prototype. So no numbers will be coming in at this point on that. But the, the overall structure of the program is you click a button that sends a command down to the Arduino. The Arduino responds with all of its object avoidance data. It'll respond with what the current speed and direction is and that sort of stuff. None of this, all of this is not wired up at this point. That's pretty cool. So the, this, this UI and the video are on the Pi. So is the idea that you just, wherever you are, you shell into the Pi. Right. From anywhere just... across the internet. Okay. So I didn't have a chance to play with my passwords yet because I've got my real passwords in there. Hopefully by the next demo, I'll have my fake best passwords in so I can give everybody else a chance to drive it if they want to. Cool. I can't guarantee I'll get to that point because I have to do taxes first. So Doug, did I understand this is a separate program from you'll be running zoom on a tablet or a phone or something for uh, the telepresence. Is that what I understood? The, yes. A zoom like thing. I expect Skype will be the actual one used. Oh, okay. Because Zoom, I think, has some some drawbacks, where Skype will be more of a I'm I'm on my telepresence and and I'm seeing and transmitting me type thing, or whoever we give rights to it. So you'll probably have two cameras and really this camera and this one for Skype. Right, the camera here is the one for the driver to look at, and then the Skype will have its own camera for showing what it can see and also showing the face or whatever of the person on it. Yeah, that seems like an effective way to do it. I like it. Yeah. We got the idea off of something on the internet that John came up with and then we've just kept singing at it. We're, we're getting closer to actually having it work now. And I'm going to quit sharing if everybody's done looking yeah. at and find out how to get back to it. Yeah. For your home use, are you just going to leave it, you know, Raspberry Pi controlled or? Uh, definitely my plan is to have it Raspberry Pi controlled. It's a, okay. you know, I've been working on it as a telepresence robot, but my, uh, my main robot that I want to use in my house is going to be based on the same sort of thing that the Pi is controlling mm -hmm. Arduino. Yeah, because I think you were saying that the delay is only like a quarter of a second or so. And yeah, you. I don't know if you could really see that because I only had the one view from the Pi, but it was very responsive driving around. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I took, uh, I forget Chris, I think was the one that said, if you lower the, uh, the resolution on the screen, it made it even faster. So I, you probably can't tell from this view, but I, I cut the resolution down to 640 by 480 and I got even better response on the camera. Okay. That's pretty cool. Oh, here we go. Stop presenting. Okay, we're back to you guys are in control again, unless there's more questions. Well, that's pretty cool. We're gonna have we got several several of us now have uh, a couple different ideas, so it's a uh, in different directions as well. So it'll be interesting to see where we go by the end of the year. Yeah, I'm hoping to get something actually functional by the time we go back to live meetings. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Um, well, let's see. So who who uh, who else has some things to some progress in the last few? 
Oh boy. Okay, I'll bring up something I just saw. So let me present something. Present. So, in process of wandering on the uh, web, I read a child this, so you might find this interesting. So, there's a yeah, speech control is supposedly easy. So, I wonder what sort of speech controller it uses. It's an Andrea, it says Andrea, so. I see it's got the microphone there. Yeah, so it says uh, easy steps. Okay, uses that. Yeah, okay. So they use Bluetooth, wireless, uh, ah, and they're using speech to text. It's basically how they're doing it, seemingly. Using the Google API, so that means you have to be on the internet. Yeah. And it says that. And also, yeah. you have an API from Google to a dev uh, key to use that. But that's not a problem. They're free. So, yeah, that I thought you might find that interesting, though. So, yeah, I've always been curious about yeah, voice slash. So, this may be a way to do it easily. Yeah, I think you're right. I think this is very interesting. I have some interest myself in speech to text and text to speech. So, so yeah, and I don't know if that can be incorporated in our remote robot, but or if we want to, but as not way to control it. And look at that. It looks like they've got it programmed in Scratch. Yeah, or Blockly, one of the two. Huh. Right. Okay. If it, well, it's MIT, so it's probably Scratch. Hmm. If it's Google, it'd probably be Blockly. But they look the same from a casual observer, and I'm pretty casual. So, <laughs> so yeah, Doug, if you want to try that out or that, <laughs> food for thought. <laughs> yes, I, I definitely will take a look at that. So it, yeah, it looks like a relatively <clears throat> homemade fruit <laughs> robot to, to boot. <laughs> It looks like he's pretty basic. Uh -huh. I see a motor controller, an Arduino, a, uh -huh. a microphone. Yeah. So yeah, and it looks like a pretty good write up. I mean, yeah, even to the code and that. So yeah. Yeah, be sure and post that hyperlink in the chat. Okay. We'll do. Well, that's a, a little of interest for people. That Instructables always has fun things. They occasionally do. Uh, let's see. How do I stop this? Are you going to build one, John? Is that added to your queue? Well, eventually, maybe. I have lots of power up queue in the queue, though, right now. You always have a nice big backlog going. <laughs> cool. So well, okay, I, post, the post. I post the link if you want to see it, Doug. I see it. Thanks. Okay. And then how do I turn off? Oh, there it's tiny. Just click. Okay. Cool. So, yeah. That's of interest. Nice. Nice. All right. So who's next? Any any other progress this week? I have some progress. Yeah. It's not much, but yeah. Um, outdoor. Yeah. I'm working on the outdoor robot. I uh, bought some big wheels. And uh, some uh, what are these yellow jacket motors, and and actually bought them before Jesse gave his meeting, and I, I saw that he had put them on his uh, his lawnmower robot, so I figured they should be good. I feel better about that now, and they're nice big hefty motors, and I have four of them, so I think it'll it'll go well. Um, and I'm designing the frame. Let's see, the frame is about two feet by one foot so should have plenty of room to put sensors and stuff on uh yeah the hold up right now is 
I need to get some uh, screws for it. I, I thought the uh, motors mounted with five M5 screws, but they're actually M4s and I don't have those. So I'm waiting on those, but I am excited about these motors. Hey, those look like pretty beefy motors and wheels. Is, is this going to be the first robot we see with the diesel electric power? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to take a big battery, though. <laughs> well, they're probably 12 volts, right? Yeah, they're 12 volt. Yeah, lo locally, we've got a place called Ellie's that's got all kinds of screws. So if I needed that size of screws, I'd just go down this block to a Yeah, I've, I've taken the other approach now. Instead of running to Elliot's or Ace all the time, I, I just, uh, like Amazon, you can get these cheap, uh, whatever you need, they got these, uh, you know, 13 bucks gets you a nice assortment of whatever. Yeah, and that's what I'm doing. I yeah. found it, yeah, for 10 bucks, you can get a huge pile of screws or you can buy them for 10, 15 cents a piece at Ace, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've, I've been doing the same thing with that. I mean, it's like, uh, if I know I need eight of things, I'll go to Elliot's or Ace and buy nine of them, you know, and because I'm doing whatever project I'm doing, but just to have them hanging around, like when you need them, that, you know, somewhere between 10 to 20 bucks, you get like 800 billion screws or 800 billion pieces you know, they count washers as pieces, but still, it's still, you get a lot of stuff for very little money. Yeah. And, and at some point the, uh, the math works out so that, uh, 10 of them at uh, a buck a piece, you might as well get, Hey, Murray, yeah. you might as well get a package of 10 that gives you a hundred or 200. Is that, is that the same kind of hot dog bun and hot dog math kind of mingling thing going on? That, that makes sense. Somebody's going to have to mute Larry. He's doing something. Oh, you hear that? Oh, yeah. That's okay. It sounds like you're ready. It sounds like you're ready to uh, talk. Do you want to? You want to go next, Larry? Well, can I show you some of my toys? Please yeah. do. Yeah. There's a. And if you want to meet anyone on the, I mean, just we can all introduce ourselves if you like. But uh, Larry's joining the first time, I think, tonight. So, from Dallas. Well, let me show you a couple toys here. Oh. Well, I've got this guy here. Uh, he was a kit, a Chinese kit. And uh, wow, no, it's eyebrows a go up and down. <laughs> and his eyelids open and close. And his eyes turn. And there's a mouth. And it turns left and right. It's all done with. Parts will look like it's out of a, an airplane. Cool. With, with that mouth, that it, the what? With that mouth that it has, does that mean it talks back at you? Uh, well, it it came as a kit, and when I got it, the whole thing was in Chinese, <laughs> and the instructions <laughs> were videos that were all done in Chinese. Oh. And so I kind of reversed engineered it as I was watching the videos. It's like, oh, I can see what they want me to do. And so I speak, ended up putting the thing together. And it came with a voice synthesizer, which was this guy right here. Unfortunately, it only spoke Chinese. Oh <laughs> so I uh, added my own pie, which is this guy right here. And I have an MQTT interface server going. And I got myself a, where is that part? Uh, there he is. Uh, I put together a, a kit from uh, Google with the voice synthesizer and the interface to Google to talk. So I, I could talk to it and it sends the signals off to Google and it figures out what it's saying. And there too, I set up my own Raspberry Pi in it. So, well, that took care of that. <laughs> so when so you, did you find the delay going to Google to get the interface very long? 
Uh, the, actually, it's, it, the, there's two parts to it. There's an interpreter that or a processor that's here that does a lot of the speech stuff. And, uh, and then there was the interface to get the questions, you know, like the weather and all that kind of stuff. And that went over to the Google, but the, all, all the other uh, processing of the speech was done locally. And then it also speaks, and I had it go for different frequencies for depending upon what sex was speaking. And that's so how I was able to take it to work and say happy Thanksgiving to everybody and that type of thing with it. What sort Being of pilot, space did ahead. you use for the speech? Did you have to buy a, a an interpreter or some sort of? That, that was part of the the kit from Google. Ah, uh. it included that. It was the uh, what they call it, the AI vision system. Or uh, let's see if I can find that over there. Do 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 do. Oh, I don't see my hand. But well, they have the AI Y kits. Right. And uh, so I got the vision kit and the a speech kit and it was playing with that and here too i had a pie and, and it was all cute uh, interface with the mqtt server so i was able to pass things back and forth and then also watch it on my um on my ipad and controlling different things interesting so that's where those toys it, this is not your first project is it <laughs> it's just nice to be able to find somebody else who I could actually ask a question of and they could understand what I'm asking. Oh, cool. Cool. So I, I'm really excited about this group. We, we like to play uh, Stump the Club. And because uh, if you got a question, we'll come up with an answer if we have to invent it just to say something. I just have one question. Larry how, long, Larry, how long have you been doing robotics? Oh, about 30 years. Okay. All right. Not, uh, not last software. week. I'm a software engineer. Oh. Okay, and uh, I've done embedded real-time work. And I've always cool. wanted to build my own robot that, uh, you know, who's got time? Yeah. But I said, well, if I'm going to do it, I better do it pretty soon. <laughs> I hear you. So I'm starting to do some of these other things. So this is the, oh, this is my base to a segue. And I took the big handle off that sways back and forth, which they use for a uh, knee control for turning left and right. Yeah. And then you forward and back. And my attempt at this was to oh, get this guy. I'm under the impression that Larry's actually part time comedian as well. <laughs> <laughs> Or at least so actually, a, a part of a clown alley too. Okay, uh, this is a this sat on the Segway, and you can see that there is a actuator there. So I attempted to make it so it would tilt back and forth like this, and I was trying to use that to control the Segway. And uh, it turns out that the Segway itself is not tilted oriented. Rather, there's uh, little pedals inside of the our, our pressure pedal, pressure huh. plates inside. So when you lean forward, you're pressing on the plates inside. Huh. So, so at this point, I'm kind of want to go and tear apart that base and see if I can find the interfaces and see if I can figure out the electrical connections rather than having to do it uh, physically. Instead of making Larry, a flat-footed robot. To, yeah. <laughs> so, Larry, if I were to mention the names Dow and Cindy Sanders, do those names mean anything anything to you? They do not. They do not? Okay. Cindy's a big clown alley kind of person, too. I, I know several people. How about Melody Lenz? How about that no. name? No? Okay. Just no. checking. I, I was only checking because I know a lot of people in the industry. They clown around a lot. Um, uh, oh, and that kind of stuff, and they do a lot of magicians. Like clown alleys. Yep, and they got lots of clown alleys. I, I was explaining clown alleys to a friend of mine one day, and they thought I was full of it. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it really is. There's clowns. They hang out in alleys, and they. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to clown school up oh, in yeah. uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. 
Oh. And they went through and gave me how to do costumes and makeup without making a mess of yourself. What's the guy? He had he had a thing in the mall for the longest time. I know this has nothing to do with robotics. Um, and he was a big clown studio guy. Uh, dang it. I'll remember sometime. But anyway, I'll shut up for now. I'm dragging us down some rat hole that we uh, don't want to go down to. Oh, we're not <laughs> going down to. Well, I'm, I'm a member of the clown out the mid cities clown alley. Oh it's my god! Parades and yes, benefits for kids who are battered homes, that type of thing. Yeah, those, I, those I kids are a lot of fun. I would imagine there's a pretty big overlap between clowns and robotics, actually. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, told you, I told you Murray would show up with all that. I told you would. <laughs> At least by judging on the content of our attendees, but yeah. So the third way, did you get that from their dev thing that they were putting on, or did you buy that just off the shelf? What are we talking about? The Segway. The Segway itself? Yes. It was off the shelf. Okay. Because they were doing Walmart. they were doing some sort of dev startup thing at one point, and then they went commercial. Yeah, that was a while back. No, this is a Walmart special for. Uh, 150 bucks. Cool. Can't hardly get that kind of motors for that price. Yeah. And I figure it's nice and strong. And I, I've had a Segway in the past. Unfortunately, I fell off of it and broke my arm. Oh. And so my wife will never let me ride it again. So I'm going to use it for a robot instead. Is this while you were trying to drive it into the Vo uh, Volkswagen with a bunch of other people on Segway? <laughs> So is your plan to make a balancing robot? Or are you going to have a robot that it just drives with the subway and you have a, a wheel to take the third spot? No, I don't want, I don't, I want to make a two wheeler out of it. Okay. Yeah, At least you didn't make all a the, turn. All the uh, uh, logic to do with that is already built into the Segway. And uh, so if I could just figure out what the electrical connections are to control it. Uh, I know that uh, the Segway currently comes with a app that's on your phone where you can remotely control it. Unfortunately, it's a high prior proprietary secure communications link and I couldn't find any documentation as how to actually use it. You kind of hope it's for secure and... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they talk about people being breaking into it as, as you're riding and all of a sudden the thing decides to make a left turn yeah. and people falling yeah. off. Yeah. Is that what happened with the inventor? Yeah, I think he, he fell off of a cliff. Yeah, he made he a left turn off, off of a cliff. cliff. Oh, no. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the inventor. That was the first guy who bought it out of Dean, Dean Kamen's outfit. Okay. So he, was, he was an owner. He was an but owner. He wasn't the inventor. Was he like <laughs> the founder of TikTok or something? <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> so, Larry, have you seen our uh, the outdoor contest that we have coming up in August? Are you at all interested to uh, add some challenge to your Segway and have it navigate around outside? Well, I, I, I saw on your thing on uh, Saturday yeah. about the, the racing that was going on. He was talking about his, his Supermax, I guess they called him, or something like that. Yeah, his, his over-the-top one, yeah. And that how he was uh, following a line around the the, uh, the parking lot and had to go up between the cones. And I thought that was interesting. And uh, yeah, it'd be kind of fun to, to go to one of these things. I don't think this segue would be, will qualify under that category. I think yeah, it would be a more of a, hey, can I stand still type thing and uh, <laughs> can I turn? And eventually make it a, a, autonomous, all right, rather than under uh, human control. Hey, Larry, so if I could just hook it up to my dog and let him take it for a walk. I just posted a link in the chat from a, a website of a guy who built an autonomous uh, robot out of a hoverboard, and uh, actually saw him running it in person. It's quite impressive. Oh, okay. I'll check it out. I see it there. Okay, cool. And, th and then I also have uh, this one kit that came from Spark Fun, 
which we had the, uh, the uh, well, I have it all torn apart now, but it had the uh, neural net processor on it and the v NVIDIA processor. Yeah, and I kind of played with that and then did the that. neural network stuff just to see how I could make the stocks work for me, that type of thing. Uh, by the way, Larry, I posted a link to my friend's Facebook page. You may not know him as Dallas Cindy Sanders. You may know him as Boopsy Clown. Yeah, but once they put the makeup on, they don't look the same. They don't look the same. No, they do not. <laughs> yeah, our, my whole family was dressed up as clowns and went and did parades. So, yeah, imagine Thanksgiving dinner at Larry's house, all dressed up as clowns. Get that one. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we had a scout group here, and I took all the dads into the back room and dressed them all up and came out. Fantastic. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Anyway, those are my toys. Hey, very cool. Well, welcome aboard. Good very to meet cool. you. And uh, hope you find it interesting to um, you know, keep coming back. And if you get stuck, feel free to throw questions out. Like I say, we may not have the answers, but we'll be happy to invent some for you. All right, you bet. So, uh, okay, so anyone uh, anyone want to jump in next? I'll go. All right. Okay, I've been working on um, linear actuators, and I've got two different ones in the picture. I'm going to see. I... Okay, can you see my hand moving in there? Because <laughs> I can't see it. Nope. No, okay. Um, okay, right now. now. Yes. Yep. Okay. Anyway, this is the, the output shaft of a linear actuator. And that's the one that I'm going to use for steering for the, um, <clears throat> the riding mower um, control. And this is another one. Um, that's going to be used for the speed control. So what I've done is just try to figure out the best way to to drive it. You know, the, you know, based on the characteristics of the two. Um, this one has a uh, an encoder in the back and a small switch right here. And when it wakes up, it, it's not going to know where it is. So it, I have to drive it towards the switch hit the switch and reset the encoder count. And then I can, you know, basically after that, I know which position I'm in, the, you know, the, um, the nut is all the way, you know, close into the, to the drive mechanism. Um, so then I can, I can position it pretty much anywhere I want. So I have to do that every time I power up. Otherwise, I don't know where it is. Um, this one has a potentiometer in it, um, so when it wakes up, I always know what the position is. And what I did is just um, write uh, a program so that, you know, oh, and this is on a, I don't know if you can see, yeah, you can see that. Um, I don't know, Arduino Mega uh, with a VNH5019A. Um, dual motor driver and i've got a, um, a little oled that tells me either what the encoder count is or what the it's, it's kind of like the a to d count um which is 10 bits um so uh it's the what was kind of odd is the potentiometer is actually a 10k pot but it only goes up to about 5k when it's when it's fully extended so i only get counts from 0 to 512 out of it for positioning which is okay that's it's more than accurate enough anyway so see if i can get things moving i have to hang on to this nut until it 
because there's nothing to prevent it from spinning on the shaft. Real exciting stuff here, going towards the switch. And it positions it in three different places. And then reads out what the, uh, what the position is on the display, but I don't think you can see what that is. And then basically does three different positions on the linear actuator. Well, Ray, you got one circle. Right. You got a completely robotic noise going there. <laughs> Yeah, that's it's being transmitted through the table. It's kind of like one of those nineteen fifties sci-fi movies. Oh, sound is perfect. Yeah, there you go. Probably the linear actuator. Anyway, that's what's going to go on the on the riding mower. We're just oops. Huh? Turn my camera off. Where Jesse had. Um, you know, he had mechanisms to shift with. Um, I don't have that. I've, I've replaced the um, the manual. It was a six-speed manual transmission with a hydrostatic transaxle. So I just have to move the, the lever um, basically up and down with the, um, with the one with the encoder on it. And that will give me my my direction and speed and the other one is used for steering um and so in the when the one for speed is in the center um it's not driving forward or reverse and it it acts as like a basically is braking so i can you know i don't have to have a brake or a clutch i can just go to the center position if i want to stop or you know if i was going forward Go to the center position and stop, and then go in reverse. So, anyway, how much force does that thing have? Say that again. How much force? I mean, how 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 is it even measured? The force is it like in in newtons or, you know? Oh, the linear actuator. Um, as far as I can tell, that's that's like a two hundred newton one. And I wanted it to do like an inch per second. And it's a little bit less than that now because, you know, as far as if I can't, if I, let's see, if the linear actuator is slower than that, my, my turning radius gets bigger and bigger the faster I go because I can't turn instantly or can't move the wheels instantly. Um, so, yeah, that's about 200 Newton. The other one is actually, um, uh, it's a seat positioner, um, so it can lift, you know, somebody that weighs 300 pounds. That one's pretty, probably overkill for that, but the price was right. They were only 15 bucks. So, um, and the linear actuator I got from Tanner's. I've had it for a while. But uh, You said there's a pot right in the actuator? Yeah. And you bought it that way? Yeah, yeah, you can get them, um, like if you look on Palulu, um, they sell ones with feedback and with and without. And um, so the, the ones with feedback typically have a potentiometer in it and it's proportional to the, you know, the position of the, the actuator rod. Um, and others, others have limit switches in them. So they, they just, you know, tell you that you're end of the travel on on either end, and uh, just by reading the potentiometer, I can I can tell where I'm at or how close to to I am to the, you know, the limits of the actuator. And just as long as I don't go beyond that, I won't break it. <laughs> so anyway, you're um, controlling the speed by just your the voltage of the, your feeding the actuator with. Well, the uh, on the one uh, for speed, it's actually um, encoder counts. I just tell it to go to so many encoder counts, and um, you know, kind of the center is neutral. And um, let's see, in this case, all the way out closer to the button uh, or the the switch that 
tells it where the starting point is, that's full forward, full speed forward, and then at the other end of the lead screw is, you know, full speed reverse. So, so it varies the speed depending upon where, where it's at. It, say that again? If you're varying the speed of the actuator depending upon its position? Oh, yes. Yeah, because it's just on the transaxial, it, it's just a, a lever that you push or pull. Um, which on most lawnmowers, that would be like a, you know, a foot actuator. You press a pedal to go faster and faster forward. You know, the further down the pedal was pushed, and then if you let it go, usually they snap back into neutral. And then there's either a second pedal, or you push like on the on the heel of the pedal to get it to go in the other direction. And um, so it's not it's not like a zero turn lawnmower, but it's kind of a synonymous to an automatic transmission in a car. You know, you don't have to shift individual gears. You just, you know, put it in the gear and, well, uh, maybe that analogy breaks down, but you don't have to shift gears, basically. So, like on most, a lot of the lawnmowers, riding mowers anyway, are, they have manual transmissions in them. You have to actually push in a clutch and change the gear and, um, so this is a lot easier because um, Jerry, or not Jerry, uh, uh, Jesse was saying he was having issues with shifting uh, the manual transmission on the John Deere mower that he showed. And it, you know, so I can do pretty much everything I need to do with the two actuators. Um, there's, uh, there's another thing you can do with the transaxles if you if you have a break on either output shaft, you can steer that way. So it's kind of like a skid steer. If you break one, the other one will turn through the differential um, in whatever direction you were going. And so you, you know, break the left wheel to turn left and the right wheel to turn right. But that's that kind of gets into some complications and there's not a lot of space to put brakes on the on the output shafts. And so I'm gonna go with this first. I'm gonna try that. So cool. That's well, awesome. I got a lot that needs mowing. You do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I was gonna ask if cutting the grass during Robo Columbus is damaging the environment. Or requested. It's hard to say. There might be bonus you know, points. Personally, I don't think so, but, you know. <laughs> Too bad there's a 65-pound limit, hey? Yeah, this thing weighs way over that, so. All right. Cool. Uh, all right, so maybe I'll jump in at this point. Uh, so uh, I, I uh, didn't have enough time. I made progress on, the, on this guy. Um, so the good news is that asteroids mode now works. Woohoo! The bad news yeah. is I don't have a very good video, so I can't really show it tonight. And then the middle of the road news is that um, I discovered some interesting things about the BNO 55. So I want to show those at another time after I get a little more data. But basically, uh, I put it in the IMU plus mode where it should only be gyroscope and accelerometer, but it's still fusion mode. And when it sits still, I mean, it's rock solid. I, I let it, I literally let it sit still for a day and it measured the exact same heading to the 10th of a degree. It didn't change over 24 hours. And then I put it on the turntable and I just rotated it back and forth and it's off a couple degrees. It is the craziest thing. So I can't, I, I need to dig into that, but I'm going to try and summarize that to show in the, in the next point. That in the asteroids video, with any luck, I'll have something to share on that next week. So, but instead, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, especially with the peak of attendance tonight, I'll I'll put up the slide. So uh, just about the club, uh, put on the president hat for a minute. So. Uh, so Saturday we had uh, Sparkfin Ambassador Jesse visit, and 
for those of you that need a reminder or, or didn't catch it, uh, he's generously prepared a couple of coupon codes for DPRG for Spark Fun. So this first one is 15% off any Spark Fun original, the red board, and that's going to uh, last to the end of April. And then the other one is 10% off through the end of the year. So uh, make a note of those if you'd like while this is up there. Uh, the next little bit of housekeeping is uh, again, try and help help uh, Kareem and Iron Rain team out. Kareem, I haven't signed up just yet, but I'm planning to, I guess. You still need volunteers for this coming Saturday? We absolutely still need volunteers. And I was going to make a plea. So thank you for, for doing this. This would have been the, this is, so this is our fourth year. Again, it's not like a normal competition. Uh, it's remote, but uh, this is our first, fourth year holding it. And I, uh, up until just now, I thought that this is going to be the first time we didn't have a DPRG um, member helping out with, uh, with judging. So Glad to hear that you're coming on board, and uh, if anybody else can join, we we still appreciate it because we still need more judges. I'll I'll put the link directly into the chat. Uh, Thank you. And I hope some others will join me. It's uh it's rewarding to uh see the gleam and of of uh of satisfaction in the kids as they go through this contest. They put a lot of effort into it, and they got some pretty cool ideas and some pretty neat robots and. Uh, I don't know about anyone else, but I typically learn something from from helping out and uh, just participating. I appreciate it, Carl. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. So anyone else is uh, willing to join, uh, I'll see you there. Um, the next thing here, uh, Harold, you, you hinted at the 21st of April with the blind via guy from Twitch presenting Hackster. So I guess you don't have it posted yet, but is this the right place for people to watch if uh, when you do post it? Meetup, Harold, I think I've muted you because there's some noise. What noise out of me? Come on. <laughs> Background noise. No, that is the place. If you'll go, okay. uh, if you'll just go, if you will go join that meetup, you'll get an email automatically. Um, when I post it, I was supposed to get it posted uh, yesterday, uh, sometime this weekend, but it didn't happen. So it'll be uh, probably sooner tomorrow. I'll get the post up. Um, with cool. All the yeah. Meanwhile, it's a it's a great group, Harold, and uh, a couple other local guys uh, host, and they do a fantastic job. So uh, I'm sure we'll bring this up again next Tuesday night. But meanwhile, feel free to join up for that meetup. I'm also trying to get bald engineer which is an element 14 guy that on yeah. to come talk to us as well. He does a lot of fun stuff. James is really a, a cool guy and I've pinged him a couple of times. Um, I got to ping him some more. Just, we haven't hooked up yet, but I'm, I'm trying. Hey, with, with any luck. Yeah. Um, and then just the next couple of things. So I did confirm, uh, actually today, I confirmed that uh, Miro and Max will present on the 8th of May on their uh, XO my Rover. They told me by email, for those that uh, didn't hear already tonight, uh, they've had 20 people around the globe build a couple, build a build an XO mine. So they're going to present to us. That'll be cool. Uh, and then we have a June presentation lined up. Uh, July 10 is open. If someone has a volunteer thing they'd like to present or a request. And then we're working towards the 21st of August outdoor rover competition. And then the last thing I'll post in the chat, um, I, I would ask that we don't show that on this recorded video, but um, but there's a new Boston Dynamics video out and uh, somebody's uh, trained a spot to fill oh. a red solo cup with beer. It sounds like Murray's seen it. So <laughs> anyhow, it's, it's, uh, it's rated L for language, but uh, take it for what it is. And if you enjoy it, I hope you enjoy it. So. Those are my updates for the night. Carl, that, is that the one? Is that the one where it's a four-letter word hyphenated with bot, and the four-letter word is a a word that describes urination? Yes, in fact, it is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and a kid who looks like uh, he's barely—I don't know if he could even graduate college. The, the, the guy that does the video, but uh, he's he's soliciting money from sponsors, and then. 
on this video, he's talking about how he misappropriated it to buy himself a spot. So I don't know. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you do that, but hats off. You know, so, that'd, uh, be a, that'd be a hell of a hit at, uh, you know, if I was in college and I saw a dog walking around that uh, <laughs> urinated beer, I'd, I would be, uh, yes. I mean, yes. I'd, yeah. You know, it, it's so called. It's the right, anyhow. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I, uh, I had to split away for just a moment or two, but if, if someone else could just jump in, and John, if you could help while I'm out, and then that'd be great. Carl, are you going to be posting those uh, links? Oh, uh, uh, which ones? For, for the upcoming events? Um, on this slide, I put most of them in the chat already. I can okay. put the rest. I'll, I'll repeat the rest of them here. Uh, and, uh, yeah. I don't have the codes from SparkFun in um, copy paste form, their bitmap right now, but well, let me know if you can't find what you need in the chat and we'll, we'll get it up there. Yeah, okay, I see them in there right now, a bunch of them, so thanks. Cool. All right, so who, who wanted to jump in? Uh, well, I stepped away for a minute. I can jump in. Um, Excellent, go for it, Marie. Yeah, um, I've got a whole lot of little things. Um, let's see. Well, Carl, I have, oh, he, Carl's leaving, but before you leave, Carl, I've got my little um, mechanic robot. The hardware is all finished. It's got the little tiny um, uh, micro gear motors, the encoders, everything's all up and running. But I had, as, as people on the list or the video may understand, Carl has made his, offered his code in C to me, but I'm writing in Python. So in order to actually code this thing, I'm going to have to port the code or figure out what he did. And there's a lot of work on this. So I'm actually going to put this robot aside for probably a month. Um, I have been busy. I'm trying to think if I get my video to I pin my stuff. The hardware looks good. I mean, that's a nice yeah, petite it, little. Yeah, it's it's quite small. And and currently I'm using a, um, a, what do they call these, battery bank or whatever. But it's only five volts and it's not really good enough. So I've got an on order from Pololu one of those, um, what do they call the power supplies that can boost. And I'm gonna replace this battery with the six double A's mounted over top in these areas here to keep the balance on the robot. Because obviously on something like this, weight has to be distributed evenly. But it's got the two, um, uh, what are they called? PyCon zeros. And there's a Raspberry Pi uh, zero at the bottom. So this is gonna be a Pi zero computer a robot, I mean, and then I've got my little uh, mounts in the front where you can basically just plug sensors and things on there like that. So it's all kind of there, and I'm hoping that by pulling the battery out of the middle, I'm going to drill a 50 millimeter hole in there, and then from the top mount one of those new sensors, which, by the way, um, uh, Pimeroni has offered to send me a basically a prototype of their new. Uh, uh, optical flow the optical flow sensor but i was trying to think of the name the actual model name but i can't it's an optical flow sensor but it operates at short distances so i had done that test well over a year ago of looking down with the current pm w3901 or whatever it is and it just barely you know that at, at 85 millimeters that's kind of its limit whereas the new one is designed to look at floors and so it's designed for not bushes and things that a drone would see but designed to look at at short range at surfaces like floors so hopefully that will really work on this robot so that's kind did of what you say is. did you say they're shipping already no they've offered to send me a prototype oh, so okay. and, and i actually mentioned you kareem that they should get in contact with you because you were one of the other people who'd expressed interest so um if they haven't contacted you um let me know and i'll give you the name of the person offline and okay. you can contact me directly Cool. I think that they'd be happy to. They showed me a photograph of, and they've got a whole, you know, fab board of like 50 of them they're building as prototypes. So I'm sure one could be spared to you. Um, on the other side of things, I'll move over here and rotate down. Now this is my KDO1 robot. And I bought a pair of these things. They're from a company called, what is it? Uh, I squared C driver from... 
I can't think of the name of the company, but there's an SPI driver and an I squared C driver, and you basically plug them in as an intermediary, and you get a nice little sense of uh, the actual signals going across your SPI or I squared C buses. And why I'm doing this is that behind here is a uh, ESP32, a tiny Pico from Unexpected Maker, and I've actually that's what that and that's what these are. This is an, uh, a tiny Pico, and then there's also the same thing uh, on a feather style or feather format. So they're kind of the new boards from Unexpected Maker, and they're really cool. They run this one runs MicroPython, this one runs CircuitPython, and will soon have an alpha of MicroPython. I've also got the QtPy, which is the even smaller, but that's an RP2040, which I'm actually kind of not so thrilled about. Um, they're fine, but if you think about it, this thing has two 240 megahertz uh, cores. This has got um, I think one 120 megahertz core, and it's got you know half the processing power for this. You know, this is four dollars. This is fifteen or something like that. But I'm not going to be buying a ton of them. And I'm really happy with this little board. It runs MicroPython natively, and uh, it comes installed already. And um, so I'm what I'm doing is now trying to figure out how to get that master slave thing running on that board. So I'm hooking my bleh, this. What I'm doing is the this is connected to the Pi via I squared C, and I'm trying to work out. I actually have to port the library myself because there's a, it's, I think it's called there's Pi for Mata and there's a couple others, but I'll have to try to do all the porting myself because and I'm not a Python programmer. I mean, I'm not maybe a year or so because I've tried all these RP twenty forties like this one and this one. And they're fine, but I'm not all that thrilled with the way they work. I, I kind of like the ESP32s better. Um, apart from that, um, I have software news only. I guess I'm, I'm in the process of still working through my async IO library that will do the, uh, the message bus. It's an asynchronous message bus. So the sensors or whatever would send signals in, messages in, and they get distributed once to each subscriber in a publish subscribe uh, format. And I've got that kind of running now. It seems to be fine. It actually has a garbage to col to a collector at the end of the uh, cycle. So every time this thing runs through a 20 hertz cycle or a 50 millisecond cycle, um, all the subscribers get the message and can either uh, accept it or consume it. And then they republish it back onto the bus. And at the end of that, it goes to the last subscriber, which is the garbage collector, and that basically dumps it. And for this project, since it has wider application, I'm actually going to try to figure out how to um, do a standard Python distribution where you can actually install it with pip. And it's a good education for me because I've never tried to do that. And then you can just, anyone on the command line can just say from PyPy, you just say, sudo pip3 install in the name of my library and you'd get it on your robot. And um, so that's kind of what I'm doing software wise. And it, like I said, it'll be a good education for me because I, I use software like that, Pi Quaternion and all these other Pi libraries. And um, it would be good to learn how to do that. And then uh, what I'll start to do is modularize my, ro my robot operating system into like a core and maybe my um, PID controller. And you could then just install the pieces you want and that way, I don't, I've got this big monolithic directory of like 50 files, and a lot of them aren't being used. And the idea is that maybe a few months from now, I'll have a thing where you could just go onto a brand new Raspberry Pi, type the components you want at, in a setup file, a standard Python setup file, and it would download those, install them, and then you just say on a command line what you want, and it would just run up the robot. And that's kind of where I'm heading with that. So um, hopefully that will be done in a month or two. So, but that's it for me in terms of news. Pretty cool. Crank them hey, along. Um, Jesse had a reference to um, some TI millimeter wave um, radar setups, or, or you know, basically they were using the radar and you know correlating that with like people on a you know from a video camera and basically saying, you know, where they were in the image and how far away they were. And, mm -hmm. um, so probably if you just look up TI millimeter wave, um, 
one of the packages there is the IRW 6843AOP, and they have several different evaluation boards. I thought I saw a reference there to Ross. It was it's made to work with Ross. Mm. Um, anyway, the AOP is an antenna on package, so mm. they've integrated the antenna right on the on the package itself. So um, that was pretty cool, and. Um, the I think the cheapest evaluation board was a little bit over a hundred, like hundred and twenty four or something. Mm. Um, and they kind of go up the more the more things that are integrated into it. Um, and then Andre Spice, or maybe maybe Chris can help with the pronunciation of his of his name. Uh, just did a I don't know if it was an updated video, but two weeks ago he put out a similar video to one he had done three years prior on the really cheap radar sensors and i know you you kind of ex expressed an interest in that mm. so i haven't watched it i don't know what it's about I, i'm assuming he's kind of going over what he did before because the parts of the video look the same right but um those would be a lot less money than the ti ones but yeah yeah TI ones and, and the D, and the df robot one that i had for like a week before it exploded um and then they wouldn't replace it because it was a cheap part um all these ones that i found on aliexpress are you know they're only a few dollars and they're tiny little boards they only use 30 milliamps or something like that they're you know they're not big power and they're a radar and they're, they don't give yeah. you distance it's not a distance radar or anything like that but it's a you know motion detector yeah. and uh, if that's all you're trying to do is motion detecting then you spend more than five dollars you're you know you're not doing the right thing yeah. um it would be kind of cool to have, you know, speed detecting radars, but yeah, that gets into a whole nother thing. But the small ones, yeah, I mean, if you want to pass anything onto the mailing list or something like that, it'd be great because I wouldn't mind looking into um, some, some of the ones that are available. Okay, yeah, I put the, the one part number in the, in the oh, okay. chat here. Okay, yeah, because I've kind of just spent a huge amount of money. Like I think I mentioned in the mailing list, I spent $120 on shipping. To get a whole bunch of, i've got a whole bunch of parts coming from servo city um hardware parts for building one sixth of a mars rover it's like the servo controller for the steering and and a whole bunch of different wheel and can, basically some experimental kit to see if i can figure out what i want for one steerable wheel and if i decide that that makes sense and i can get a controller for it i'm basically building a, a planning to build a three-part Mars rover it would have three Raspberry Pis on it actually, or or possibly one Raspberry Pi and maybe some of these little controllers. The idea is that the front and the back would have motor controllers and steering controllers, and the and then the center one, which would only have to control the motion of the two center wheels with no steering, would have less of a load, and it would take on the sensing and the overall control of the robot with the front and back controllers doing all the PID control and everything. And that's why maybe a microcontroller, hopefully in MicroPython um, for the front and back. So it's a modular robot effectively. And there's this I squared C isolator that um, Adafruit provides, which you have two power supplies, one on each side. It must be opto, I guess. I'm not sure how it works, but basically you have um, an I squared C um, bus on one side and I squared C bus on the other, and you can talk across this with complete isolation, with oh. like even power supply isolation. So I would have two of those in the center of the robot, talking from the center outwards to the front and back controllers. And but this is kind of the dream. I mean, I still haven't got a master slave controller working at all yet. And until I get that working and try out the hardware for a steerable thing, the cost of this in New Zealand is going to be three or four thousand dollars by the time I put shipping in. So it's kind of like, eh. well, I was going to say, you know, with all the thermal activity, in, you know, in New Zealand, you, you probably got some areas that look like Mars, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially I've, I've hiked up there. There's a Tongariro crossing, which now has thousands and thousands of people. But when I was there, it was hundreds. And uh, you, you go over the top of the moon, basically past a volcanic opening in the ground that looks like a giant womb and there's steam coming out of it and yellow sulfuric mists and yeah it's pretty wild up there yeah kind of scary actually but yeah i don't think i'll be taking my robot there although i did think about contacting the new zealand government because they've just given up on trying to rescue the bodies of 29 miners that were killed in an explosion like 10 years ago and i thought 
look, you give me $100,000 and I'll buy a $75,000 spot and we'll run spot into that cave with a camera. It right. can't be that hard to relocate those bodies. And yeah. it seems like perfect, you know, it's a cave. And I don't know, I almost wanted to contact Boston Dynamics and say, do you guys have a way of communicating inside of a cave system up to 1.1 kilometers? And if they said yes, then I said, well, there you go. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, it sounds like the perfect job for a robot. Go into a cave and take photographs of what happened. Yeah. Um, so were they miners or what? Yeah, it was a big, big thing in New Zealand. It didn't make, you know, an international news that lasted anywhere else for more than maybe a week. But in the country here, they had a bunch of miners down in a mine and there was a, a mine explosion which collapsed part of the part of a, um, uh, the exit. And there was 29 guys killed and uh, they were down there in the mines and the families have for, this is on the South Island, for, the families have for I think like 10 years have been trying to get someone to go in and recover the bodies. And this previous government gave up and the, and the current government said they were gonna do something and then they've given up. They said it's too dangerous. They, wanna, they don't wanna sacrifice lives. But I think at this point, the families would just like to know what's going on inside the mine. And, and a robot seems like the way to do it. But I'm not really in the position to do that myself. But if someone in New Zealand heard this video and could come up with a grant proposal, they could probably buy a spot and send it into the, into the mine with a camera. I think it would be a doable. It's, it's a mine shaft. It's, I should say it's a mine. It's 1.1 kilometer walkable path. So I don't, it's not like vertical or anything. I think Spock could do it. Yeah. But, and know, then anyway, you have to on. over Spot, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, exactly. You might have to send in another spot to rescue the first spot. Yeah. So you need two of them. Anyway, I'm just blathering on, but uh, yeah. There's lots of drama in New Zealand that the rest of the world never hears of, believe me. Like my flooded basement. So who's next? Hey, Chris, what's your, what are you doing? I've already, already missed you because I got in late. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was late today. Um, well, well, I I'm actually going back. I'm actually going backwards in terms of progress because, you know, on my Romy platform. So I had to take a step back, actually. So this is kind of stripped back down to bare bones. Well, there's nothing on it. In fact, you know, mainly I had to remove the QTR line sensor. Because, you know, it, it has, you see 11 signals coming out of it, you know, eight sensors, a PWM and power. And, you know, it, it's most of them go into this one corner here of the robot and it's, it's, it's bulky. I mean, it's taken up considerable valuable real estate and I don't have much of that on this small platform. So... You know, not surprisingly, I'm running into wiring harness issues and space issues on a small platform. I mean, you know, I expect that. That's 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 the downside of a small platform. You know, I just I, I realized I can't afford these 11 wires, you know, coming up here and, and occupying space where I want to, um, you know, put the sensor. So I had to find a solution for that and, you know, haven't haven't decided yet 100 percent either i have to make some either i have to get rid of these wires and really connect some very thin ribbon cable kind of thing that just is less bulky and is you know has a connector on the other end that's designed to go exactly where it needs to go or some either it's something like that or you know the other idea is to use um you know Turn turn the QTR array into a smart sensor, right? By attaching a micro. Um, in fact, <laughs> it's the sort of thing I've wanted to do many many years ago. I have a I have a box full of old Atmel AVR chips, you know, the old twenty three thirteen or whatever it was <laughs> at the time. <laughs> I have a box full of those because I had these grand plans of turning every sensor into a smart sensor. All well, it never happened, but so so with the with the cutie pie, right? The form factor is just really, really appealing. You know, it's again, it, it, it lacks, it has actually just the right number of pins that I need. Um, I have eight analogs and I have I squared C 
and I can use one output for PWM. So I would literally be occupying every single pin of this device. But I could turn my eight sensor QTR array into a smart smart sensor. Now, I have already have the pin soldered to it. So what I'm going to have to do, unfortunately, because I don't have a lot of clearance underneath the board. So the idea would be, right, the QTR sensor is underneath, right, facing down. And maybe you can see this, right? So I have a little bit of a, a space down there. So I'd be, I'd be, you know, placing this this little fella. Oh, what am I showing? Front, back? I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, so I'd have to place a little fella down here somewhere. I can't afford these pins sticking, sticking up the way they are right now. So I'm gonna have to get rid of the pins and maybe, maybe need right angle pins so it goes sideways. I have a little bit more room that way. But that would be idea. Keep keep the QTR wiring all below, you know, below the surface, and and you know, turn it into a smart sensor array. Um, so that's option two. Option one is just thinner wires, right? So that's where I'm at. So like I said, going backwards, unfortunately, you know. So uh, Chris, um, I've actually. Kind of in the same mode as you is trying to figure out how to use like a small processor as a smart sensor as you said and um a couple of questions first of all the qt only has since it's an rp2040 it only has four analogs right four no analogs. so i'm i'm using the original qt pi which is a cortex m0 plus ah i gotcha okay yeah okay yeah. The other thing I was going to suggest is, as you know, I've been doing my own wiring harnesses, and if you go to two rows, like this one's got two, uh, you know, uh, two by three, so you get six connectors, and the biggest that these things come is six, so you get two by six, you'd get 12, either 10 or 12 connectors in two rows, and so you can actually make wiring harnesses that are a lot less bulky, and like, you know, you twist them and you end up with something like that, and um, I've been pretty happy with that. I've done that on occasion, yeah. like uh, I've wired up some of these... Uh, little displays that are SPI displays and they take like, you know, nine or 10 connectors and just doing exactly that is just bundling up the wires like that. And it's not so bulky yeah. then. Yeah, I used to do a lot more in the past, but you know, I'm finding soldering more painful these days than it was five years ago or 10 years ago because my eyesight's just not there anymore. And so I finally, I finally got myself one of these helping hands with a, you know, with a magnifying glass built in because I just I just can't do it any other way anymore. I just can't I can't see in the distance anymore and I can't see anything nearby anymore. So <laughs> the pain so, of getting over um, the soldering is I'm finding soldering more difficult than I used to find it. And so making custom wiring harnesses is just now more painful and more time consuming than it used to be for me. Uh, one thing I can suggest in that regard is that yes, I I've had the same thing. I've got varifocals. But one thing that really helps um, is getting a really bright light. Like I've got a light over my desk that when I flip it on, you're, you know, I just I just flood the zone with light, and it actually makes it a lot easier to solder. Without that light on, I would have trouble. So maybe give that a try. Okay. But um, and are we using Fermata or something like that on the Cutie Pie then? Well, so. I haven't decided yet what I how I would be doing it on the Cutie Pie. I might I might you know it's going to be either I squared C or USB serial. Where did it go? Unfortunately, you know, and I've talked about USB serial before, and it's I find that a convenient way of of getting data into the Raspberry Pi. But I again I don't have a way of getting access to the you know actual usb signals it has a usb c connector on here right and i i am stuck with kind of attaching bulky cables and bulky connectors to it all well, this mm -hmm. one converts the usb c into a usb micro so i i don't have a way of yet of of keeping the bulk down you know just of usb connectors and wiring because they're not exposing the actual usb you know, data plus and data minus mm. uh, wires. If they did, I could go straight, you know, do the same thing that I'm doing with the black pill, where, you know, I'm making my own little, very compact USB wires. Again, not very noisy immune, I'm sure, but short distance. And I'm just going straight into the, you know, raw USB pins on the, 
on the black pill. And that, again, it just helps keep the size of the connections down. I don't have that option on the cutie pie. So I might end up doing I squared C uh, in the case of the cutie pie, but I, I have it yet. In, it, it, have, it would have to be the slide. It would have to act as the, the I squared C slide. Uh, I don't know. So Dave is holding something up. Yes. Uh, Sun founder, line follower, builds a module that has eight sensors and outputs I squared C. Well, that's exactly what I want. Okay. Well, I'm saying that's available out there. So Sun Founder is Sun Founder. Okay. I'm going to have to take Sun a look. Sun Founder, right. line following module. The other thing, Chris, you can look at is that um, two things. Um, Adafruit, I, I looked up the company name for this I squared C driver thing that they have. That's that little uh, analyzer for I squared C. So you can see the signal, you literally see the signals. And um, I bought both the SPI and the I squared C. It's from a company called X Camera, one word, X Camera Labs, E X C, E X Camera, and they're 30 bucks. And so it's an I squared C driver. The other thing, um, that Adafruit sells is those little um, USB breakouts, and they have it for USB B, C, and A. And it's just a little tiny plug with a tiny, tiny circuit board on the end, and then you can connect either ribbon cables to one style or just headers or wires most on the other. Most of those, most of those are kind of the female side of it, right? Ah, and, yep. and I have what I'm looking for is a very compact male ah. USB you know, breakout thingy, you know, exactly right. like you're describing, except they are a little harder to come by in, in yeah, you know, yeah. those that are available are still bulky. So, but um, um, yeah, I mean, again, another option would be, I do have a, a pair of four channel I squared C, you know, ADS 1115, something rather boards, you know, you know, now I have two little boards that I need to somehow find room for here on, you know, so it's it's I could just go with I squared C analog inputs basically, right? Um, so yeah, I know that, what you're looking at. That's a, that's an on the go connector, right? But it's USB yeah, micro it, on one side and just a USB Type A on the other side. Yeah. Right. But you can get access to the pins on that if you wanted to solder to that thing. It's really tiny, and you could solder to the connections because they're right there where you can see them. So you would get a USB. B. Yeah, so um, I just need something like that, except with USB C. You know, that's just not ah. as common, it seems. Yes. Okay. Yes. Understood. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so the Cutie Pie has USB C, which is convenient, right? When you when you're dealing with connectors itself, it's very convenient. But for my, you know, in my case, it's less convenient. Yeah, I agree. I'm trying to think. There, I think on Al, I was looking for this kind of thing, and I think on AliExpress there are those kind of converters, but. Or, you know, it's hard to find. I wish that some of the vendors in the U.S. or Canada or the or U.K. had that just out of the box. But you're right; they don't sell them. It's all female. Yeah, and what would be nice if they had just just to have a couple solder of pads on the bottom here. You know, one is for a an SPI flash, and there's some other solder of pads down there. If they had just given me some solder of pads to the raw USB signal, and I could just solder two wires to that, and that'd be all set. You know. Ah. I just, it occurs to me, um, on the unexpected maker boards, the tiny Pico, they have these little solder pads and they supplied with those JST connectors. And it looks like, maybe not, I don't know, but you could possibly get a JST connector and just put some flow so solder, I mean, some fl fl flux on the bottom and just basically solder a JST connector to the bottom. That'd be an easy way to get a power connector. Yeah, power is less of an issue. I mean, I, it's 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 all about the USB signals, getting yeah, getting access yeah. to the raw USB signals, so that I can put as compact of a wiring, you know, a wire in place as possible. Mm -hmm. That's that's the challenge. Gotcha. Hmm. So, all right. So that's what I'm kind of trying to figure out which which direction to go there. Um, so going backwards. But I'm gonna look at the Sun Founder. I have to make a note of that before I forget. Sun Founder I squared C uh, line sensor. Thank you.
Hey guys, can I share something? Uh, so, um, not too much. Uh, I am mainly my. Um, I was in the middle of making this uh, robot, but I got stuck on this uh, wiring that I can't really turn it freely. So there was two issues. One is this. There was USB wire connected. I got past that using the wireless USB. The other part is my connections were faulty, <laughs> that it sometimes doesn't work. So this is um, so I'm, I'm working on. I mean, basically, I got this for the Wixel, and it was good. So I'm, what I'm planning to do is to use this as a, like a connection hub um, for all the. Um, motor drives, basically these, uh, the digital or the PWM signal. Now I'm also thinking about the ground five volt and the 12 volt, I'll put it on there and use these type of wires to just connect it around. Uh, so I've got two questions. One is um, the 12 volt going on here. I think my, my motor is not taking more than two amps for each motor. I think it's not a problem, but what do you guys think? So I have all the digital signal plus the 12 volt DC on here. Um, well, I, I well, think it's okay, but yeah, what, well, what do you guys think? I, so I, this I, type I, of board. I've done that many times. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it's totally, yeah. I, I use yeah. Uh, right angle plugs and all sorts of things, but basically I've done that on various robots and these are all the discards from failed experiments or changes of design. But yeah, I've used all sorts of power supplies and all sorts of boards. And uh -huh. I just keep moving the configuration. And these, you know, like this one here, for example, has all the power connections to the bottom of the robot and a, and a power switch, uh, yeah, an activation I switch. And, and yeah, look, have at it. It's That's the way to do I it. See. Totally. Kind of breadboard with all the power and digital signals all together. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, that kind of thing. cool. One, one thing you can try too, uh, you know, if you you can double up if the if the if, if the traces are too narrow, you can use two traces on that because you're using a breadboard, right? And mm -hmm. you can also increase the uh, current capability by putting solder along the whole run. So those are two little tricks. If you if you if you put it on there and you feel it and it's, you can feel any warmth at all, try <laughs> first just putting solder on it. On the tray, I see. I see, see, I see. If, if it if that cools it off, if it if it's yeah. really warm, then like I say, you might want to try two traces that are next to each other. I see. I see. Okay, I mean just some ideas. You know, yeah. you can always yeah. Yeah. one Good other idea. thing. Good idea. Yeah. Another thing you can do is you can take a piece of really say uh, large wire, strip it strip it clean. And just solder it on top of the run. That's, I see. That's another thing you can do. You probably yeah. won't need to do any of those things if you're only doing a, an amp or two. But if you feel any warmth, you might want to try this. Mm -hmm. I'd be mm -hmm. a little concerned about having that so close to your radio. I guess that's what I, having your motor leads and all that pulled right up up next to your motor up against your uh, where your antenna for your Wixel would be. Oh, okay. So, I mean, that, that would those be, are only two that separate would be a bigger boards. concern to me. Then, so I, you can get away with it. I, 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 you can try it. I mean, yeah, yeah, got it. That's um, like the other part like, is it's uh, just like a, in a Murray yeah. show. You know, he, he's got a lot of things that worked and a lot of things that didn't quite yeah. work. You know, yeah. I mean, you have to give it a shot. Yeah. Uh, the other part, I don't want to directly solder down here for the first round. Uh, what I'm thinking is using these wires. And put all these pins. I don't know if you can yeah, see yeah. these pins. Uh, I'll just those, kind yeah. of uh, connect them. Um, that shouldn't be a problem. Now, okay. I will say one thing. Remember, if you can feel heat, then you probably got your wire sizes too small. And some of the DuPont leads, especially the ones you get from China, use the smallest possible wire. I mean, it, it might look the same. But if you ever cut one in half and you look at it, you see it's like three strands of copper. I mean, it's really, really a small wire inside there. Now, 
Other ones you can get are much thicker. Now, how do you get the good ones from the bad ones? It's kind of the luck of the draw. You know, I've had some really nice leads and they came from China and there's no, nothing wrong with them, good wire. And then I've had other ones, like I said, you know, they're fine for like signal, signal, but you really probably wouldn't want to run a lot of current through them. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just uh, as a, I'm not sure how you feel about this, Doug, but I've been using 22 gauge for my motors and 26 for all the signals and stuff. And mm -hmm. so, like this board, for example, was on my first robot. And what I would do is I have a two by six, or two by three, so it's a six connector. And that's the first six connections on the Raspberry Pi, which is power, like five volt, three volt ground, and and I squared C. And that would literally just plug in like that. And then I would have other plugs that fit in certain, I even put paint dots on there to tell which plug went where. And so I would then plug that up onto the top board. And then if I took my robot apart, it was just a matter of taking those connections apart. And that way this board became modular. It was sort of like an API effectively. I knew exactly what the pins were, I documented that. And then when I made changes to the top or the bottom, I would just make sure I followed that same API. Yeah, I just think the one rule of thumb that you can generally go with if you feel something is warm or hot mm. it's probably uh, a little bit marginal and yeah. but if, if if you're using 12 volt motors one of the advantages of using high volt motors is generally they don't need as much current uh -huh. because they're 12 volts as opposed to six volts six volts to get the same power you have to have more, twice as many amps and amps are what heat up, heats the wire up so yeah. you know you you know, a good thing is though, if you're using like a high powered polo low motor that has a uh, uh, excess of six amp stall, you don't ever want to stall them by the way, but if you stalled it, it would be six amps on it. And uh, so, you know, you have to think, well, I got, you know, you, got, you have return pass. So if you have six amps going through two motors, some wire probably, probably your, uh, uh, well, I'm just yeah, saying somewhere you somewhere long. all of this stuff goes back to your battery. Your wire from your battery should be big and it gets smaller as you get closer to the whatever you're running. Do you see what I'm saying? So Yeah. The I could solder wire. my battery's connection onto this. Yeah. Make sure that's the biggest wire, right? It should be. Now, yeah. Okay. I gotta admit I I've, I've used some of these double A battery connector uh you know, little plastic boxes where you put four double A's or six double A's in them. And the wire off of those guys, some of them are pretty bad. But uh, I mean, I've actually, you know, but that's something you have to judge, you know? Yeah, there's there's like- you run into trouble, it's not good. <laughs> you know, if it's hot, it's not good. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, there's there's charts for like, you know, how much current is recommended through a certain, you know, American wire gauge wire. Yeah. Um, and same thing for printed circuit boards, you know, like if you have a certain trace width and a certain weight of copper, you know, one ounce or two ounce, yeah. um, you know, that's got, you know, those are, those are pretty much, you know. Yeah, you um, can, you can, cal you can either look it up or there are calculators online, just like what I say. And probably the one thing you won't know is, uh, Unless somebody you, you you bought your they told you when you bought your PC board is what the thickness of the uh, what the uh, what do they call it ounce ounce of copper yeah ounce yeah ounce, 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 copper ounce. typically I think uh, one ounce copper is usual on these inexpensive boards but if well, you have one that, if you got a big motor driver from somebody that's putting seventy amps you know they could have four or five ounce copper on it or more. Well, Doug, I was just looking up one of those charts, and it looks like if you have short pieces less than three feet long of mm -hmm. 18 gauge wire, that'll take up to 30 amps yeah. at 12. Yeah, you know, like I say, that's assuming you've got good connectors and everything. You probably yeah. want to just like if you feel anything warm, you know, just just fix it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, and the other thing you can do is is try to keep the, the motor circuitry as far away as possible from anything RF, um, and just the separation will help quite a bit. Yeah. So, you know. 
Yeah, so the motor I, is actually more concerned hydrogen. about you putting it on the Wixel board next to the Wixel board than I was uh -huh. the wire flush. Uh, so initially, I thought motor is DC, but the uh, motor does does it, generate a lot of well, noise. If you're using uh, if you're using a brush motor, it's yeah. actually the brushes go from commentator segment to commentator segment, so they're making and breaking circuit. And the motor is very inductive. And so in induction, the current tries to continue to flow. Since it can't flow, what you get is high voltage. All right. That's why you know you've probably owned one of those little boxes that has tin foils on two sides and a nail. And when you pick it up, the nail drops out through the induction coil and you get zapped. And the reason that works is because it's not because it's drawing that much current normally. It's the that the voltage goes up when you try to break that current. I see. Yeah. So got it. Yeah, I yeah, I'll, I'll make sure my communication still works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Far like apart it, enough. If it does, hey, I'm not. You know, it's not saying it won't work, but I'm just saying yeah, that yeah. it's probably not the best practice. Cool. Yeah, I'll try it out and. Uh, so I get past this hardware wiring issue. Yeah. Uh, the other part I want to mention is Doug, I, I, I'm interested in trying this uh, Python UI that you showed earlier. Sounds like it's similar to what I'm trying to do. I mean, uh, the, the, Doug, Doug uh, uh, who presented at the beginning. <laughs> so, so D, the so it's, it's similar to what I'm trying to do with the C sharp, but it's on the, yeah. I'm glad it's on this small computer, the Pi. So. If you're using yeah, a Pi, try it out. If you're using a Pi, you know Python sh shouldn't be. A, I mean, without the, with except for the limitations that Chris has mentioned before, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. You should have access to all the libraries. If you're using MicroPython, uh, which you know is really for embedded, uh, you won't be able to use all of the Pi all of the Python libraries, which can be a real can really suck. And uh, and you what they ha they'll have is some classes, like one of them will be called machine, and it will give you access to certain pin functions. So like there might and there might be a UART class where you can plug into certain pins. So it depends. Uh, I I wasn't here at the beginning, so I don't know who if they were talking about on the Pi or whether they were talking Yeah, about what Doug had was like a UI with the RS, uh, with the serial communication, which which mm. is what I need that UI for. So, okay. And and that Python, I always wonder how I put my computer on that uh, robot. <laughs> yeah. So a, a Pi seems uh, easier than all my existing laptop. And well, like I said, <laughs> I found the easiest ones to do a hybrid. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I got a Pi, I got a Pi camera, so yeah, that's, that's If you're going to do camera, Pi is a good option, I think. Unless yeah. you have something like, uh, uh, I think this Maxi Pi is a real good option too. And it, the one Ray uses, that's another good one. I uh, open. Open MBH7. You know, open eyes. I mean, those are all very nice uh, solutions for, for cameras because they, uh, they don't, Suck as much current as the uh, Pi does, and, I was uh, and they come with good documentation. I was going to mention one thing, Doug, is that um, in terms of MicroPython, that's what I've been digging into in the last week or so for the ESP thirty twos on the um, Tiny Pico and the Feather S two. And um, there's actually a distribution on GitHub called MicroPython hyphen lib. And it, someone has begun to port all the normal Python libraries over. I've not been successful in installing it, but if you look on or just search on Google for MicroPython lib, and that's actually, it's got, I'm looking at the directory and there's probably like maybe more than 50 of the libraries that are native to Python that have been ported oh. over. And, yeah. and so, native libraries are no problem. In fact, I, I believe I just saw that the latest revision of MicroPython has them all. Otherwise, it's equivalent to 3.7. But, oh. but the problem you have is like, okay, you want, is it Gumpy? Gumpy, I believe? Gumpy. 
Gumpy, which you almost always need when you want to do something serious, it's not available. Is that different than Numpy? No, I, okay, Numpy. I, yeah, you need that person. Yeah. So and, I'm and, just saying that if you I'm have one that has those, bringing those over, that'd be good. Well, I don't think maybe I'm not calling native is maybe not the right word because this particular set of, of libraries has been specifically ported to MicroPython as a project. And so it's not native to MicroPython. So it's like async IO, uh, trace back, um, unit tests. They've actually, when they've had to make modifications, they've put a U in front of the name of the library. So U pip for pip. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. And it looks like someone's put a huge amount of effort into trying to port over stuff that like iter tools, for example, is a library you have to normally import. It's not part mm -hmm. of Python itself. So I can highly recommend looking into MicroPython lib on anyone who's can you trying put the link, to build. Can you put the link in the link in sure. the chat? Yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. That'd be great. Yeah, but I, I doubt TK inter is included in any of MicroPython or Square Python, right? You mean like a UI? Yeah. <laughs> oh no, no, I wouldn't yeah. imagine. Be in fact, there. I don't. Yeah, that, that's yeah. that's like you're asking for the moon, Ray. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's not possible. There you go. There's MicroPython lib. Oh, beat me to it. I was just typing it. As well as some uh, uh, wire gauge and circuit card trace. Uh, resistive drop calculators and tables, so. Oh, thank you, Dave, for, I was just trying to find that, so, yeah. While you were that talking means. about it, I was hunting it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'm still trying to figure out how to install that, but actually my goal is to actually get MicroPython lib onto my tiny Pico. Um, by the way, the guy that does this, his name is Sion, Rosenblum. It turns out I was really wondering what his accent is. It's got this weird accent. It turns out he's from Australia. So he's in Melbourne, which is sort of the equivalent of Wellington. So he's got kind of a funny, uh, funny Kiwi accent, actually, but it's an Australian. And he's the developer. He's got it. You have to check out Unexpected Maker. He's He's got a whole thing. He's got like dozens and dozens of videos. He set up a Discord server. He's like a one man show. He's building all these boards and seems like an interesting guy. So but that's what I'm trying to do is get MicroPython lib onto this. So it's quite a, just finding time actually is really the hardest thing. But, but John, if you're going to try um, like to not use a Pi, I think that these little boards, like, you know, this is a two core, 240 megahertz board that is, you know, it's the size of my thumb and it's really powerful. So these are easily the basis of a robot. No problem. Cool. Yeah. I'm, you know, what I'll try to be doing is copy what uh, Doug D had, <laughs> make sure I run it. And then, you know, however little change I, 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 I can make, <laughs> I'll stick with that little change. But yeah, I, I got plenty of time this week and next week. So, you know, I, I I hope next week when I come in, I'll start programming again with the, my uh, uh, odometry and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think I'm pretty happy with the confirmation that this is a good solution. And I, I think it, it's going to be improvement from my previous crimped wire. This, yeah, it was a little uh too easy to break <laughs> like i touch it it goes back again but, uh, and the other thing i would recommend which i kind of did allude to is that as you're doing that make sure you document on a piece of paper what each wire does so you can keep track of what you've done otherwise you will lose track yeah you know one reason i i'm a bit difficult to to so far i put these pins on because i don't really have a, <laughs> have a have a good idea of what the how how the wiring will be, but uh, you know, if I'm using all these wires and use it as a connection board, hopefully it's something I just keep plugging and you know if it works, one channel I'll document that. <laughs> yeah, well, make them in groups. Like this is like a wiring harness, and I've 
you know, this is a two by three and this is a six by one with an extra connection here that has a little color on it. On the, and I've actually documented what this particular wiring harness is for. And so when I go back, I look in my notes and I can figure out, and you know, this is part of like a particular assembly. And if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't even know what this was for and you end up pulling things apart and because you can't uh -huh. figure it out. I've spent uh -huh. hours bugging my own hardware when I hadn't done it right. So, uh, on that, my current plan is I'll first use these these uh, bot wires, and if this work, I'll just uh, take these single. I mean, these are these are one to one, right? So I'll take yep. it out of the shell, and I have these. Uh, I don't know how you call this. These little like six by two or, or four by two type. So what I'm thinking is I take it out, put it in my own shells in the correct form factor. Yeah, that's right. That's what I have. Yep. So I, I'm a bit cons concerned about crimping my own wires. So, I mean, I know you, you said about these uh, putting a little solder on there and reflow it. Well, but, I, you know, <laughs> I, I think don't, you're I, right. I, I want to avoid that. Yeah, I think you're fine because that's actually what I've done on occasion. In the end, I've ended up making my own because I'm a masochist. But um, if you're going to use store-made wires, you just take a sharp little pair of pliers or whatever and stick that in there, and then you can pull the wire out and put it into a new housing and just organize. Right, yeah, 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 yeah okay, exactly. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I'm thinking prototype it, and then if it works, I'll put it in the new housing. <laughs> David's oh, advocating yeah. crimping your own wires, but... That works, but you can also just take the commercial ones that you've got, John, and just pull them out of the housings they're on and put them into your own housings in some kind exactly. of order. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That, that's 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 what I'm thinking to yeah. avoid the second round. <laughs> Hopefully, this round it will it'll be secure connected. The only oh, disadvantage yeah. in using the store bought ones is they only come in usually a couple different lengths. And what I found is that, like, if I wanted to put a, a wire from my Raspberry Pi all the way across the robot and then up a mast onto where I'm keeping my BNO 55, I need a longer wire. And I ended up deciding to build my own harnesses. But yeah. you can certainly get away with just crimping your own, or, or you know, if you don't want to solder, as David well, says, you get a crimp tool, they work fine. Yeah. yeah. About ninety percent of the wires that you can handle uh, the standard three or so, four lengths that come off of uh, uh, AliExpress or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You, maybe it's uh, revision two. So if I really need to customize it, there's another revision. But I just want to get past this uh, hardware. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. This is good enough. Yeah. Do you have a <laughs> constant current power supply? Oh, the the what the power supply? Yeah, do you have a constant current power supply, like I, where you I can? I have this. I have the. Uh, I have this type. <laughs> I'm using this type. Oh, okay. So it's it's, uh, it's it's working out fine. So I, I have a. Um, well, I have to say, last time I used it is like a couple of months ago. So I have this output 12 volt out of this. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, there's just two pin. So yeah. I made a made a harness to take it out with um, with a fuse mm -hmm. and a switch. So yeah. I think I I think I think this is pretty good. I mean, it's mm. compact and it it, it can yeah. be very powerful. Hey, right. Even hey, if you don't, I think you probably need to explain what a constant current power supply is, so oh, that okay. for folks that don't know may then be a little education right yeah it's it's kind of like a lot of them are set up so they're they either supply constant voltage like a dc voltage oh and uh but they can also be set up to supply a certain amount of current and you don't you don't necessarily need one if you, if you just have a you know like a big power resistor you can set up a circuit to test how much voltage drop you're going to get across your wires. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, set up a circuit so it draws like one amp or something, and then just stick your voltmeter leads across your wires, and you'll see what, what kind of voltage drop you're going to get. So um, that's, a, that's an easy way to test, you know, before you 
go to the trouble of building things up and you realize that your wires are too small or something like that. Do you, yeah, you have one, so, right? Yeah. Yeah, so basically, John, you can get yourself a supply like this. And normally, I mean, we usually use them in uh, constant voltage mode. So you set the you set the voltage you want, and then it it puts out as much current as the load as the circuit draws until you hit the limit. And what you can do though with these supplies is that you set the current knob to say, well, I don't want to give any more than uh, so many amps or something. And then and then uh, then it'll then when you then in that mode you can just short out the terminals. And it will adjust the voltage until it gets the until it provides the current that you want. Right. So that way, that way you can uh, that, that mm -hmm. way you can figure out if your traces, you know, are warming up because you can give it a constant current, and you can measure the voltage drop, and you can measure how much. Uh, I would say fingerprint removing capacity the wire has at the time. That's right. Yeah. I see. So, so this is like a safety measure, right? Safety measure while tuning this. Just want to see what is the resistance. Of the yeah, wire. it's like an easy way to test. Both. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. Those those power supplies, uh, they're good ones and better ones. I've got one just uh, very similar on my desk. And they can be had from somewhere between, between about seventy to about one hundred twenty bucks, depending on um what you have and yeah um there um i know you're just you're coming probably off five volts or the you got your your power supply there volts, if yeah. they usually run from a range of about zero to 30 volts and somewhere between zero and five amps depending on which one you got going on so you're it's really flexible on how much you want to think but for instance i couldn't get some stepper motors to move i don't know this is a couple of years ago we're like man we're doing everything we're doing it right and it turns out that we'd had the current turn way down, so we weren't pushing enough to even get them to move. You know, it's just we had to go, we just went through all the steps to make sure everything was going. And you have that flexibility to now, I am only want to get, like Carl just said, I only want to give my circuit two amps, and then let's see how it reacts. Yeah. You know, so you mm -hmm. get that kind of thing. It allows you to do all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. putting it on your list of things to get is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. My center has those uh, for about eighty-five dollars. Yeah, linear one. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I'll I'll make sure I feel the wiring whether it's warm. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think I got a fuse here. So, yeah, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll go the e easier one. I mean, I don't have a current uh, controlled uh, supply. But, um, I'll make sure I feel the wire if. If I feel anything, I hope it doesn't even feel warm. Just remember, when you feel the wire, the technique is like this. It's not like, is that warm? This is a bad technique. This is a little bit better. Could be that hot. <laughs> right, okay. I think you're just testing whether a soldering iron is hot yet or not. Yeah, you, uh -huh. you can get away with this on a soldering iron, but uh, I, you wouldn't want to do that on a soldering iron. So Yeah, wow. I'm going to go out on a limb and say pretty much, uh, most of the people that are laughing at all that right there, what Carl said, they've done it. <laughs> <laughs> More than once, probably. <laughs> More than once. Yeah, one of the and guys that on I, purpose. <laughs> one of the guys that I know who's a real geeky guy, he's got every tool in the box, has some kind of a little device that you just aim it at something and push a button and it takes a temperature reading at a distance. Any buddy, how much do those things cost? $13. Yeah, oh. I've seen them. I've seen them anywhere from like yeah. 12, 15 bucks to like hundreds of dollars, depending upon how accurate you think you need to be. Right? We, what, are got, what are they called? What are they called? Infrared thermometers. Ah, yeah. okay. Cool. We, we use one to measure the uh, to measure the temperature of the griddle for pancakes because my father-in-law had a problem with undercooked pancakes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so clearly the solution was was an infrared thermometer. <laughs> of course, uh, I have was, COVID. He was using That's it for a certain device to have. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 where can I get a cheap one? I'll put a link in for the one I know. Yeah, thanks. I think that that sounds if you, like if you uh, have a if you have a Harbor Freight near you, just drive into Harbor Freight and they'll have one there for like 10, 12 bucks. Oh, Maximum okay. of twenty bucks. 
See, this one, which is 22, I splurged for the $22 one because it has the ability to uh, adjust for emissivity of different surfaces. Oh, he's <laughs> wanky. We are so wanky. Does that include skin? <laughs> I, I forget what's on the chart. Um, here, I'll share the screen. You can it, see how hot your partner is. You know? You got to be careful where you aim it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah, I didn't mean to get there, but <laughs> yeah, it, uh, well, you can see from the chart it has aluminum, asphalt, basalt, copper, oh. dirt, hot food, ice, iron, limestone. Wow, food, wood, I water. Want. I stone. want it. Has I thought I saw blood in there? No steel, hey, Carl. I don't know if I'd ever use one, but I just want one now because they're kind of cool. Skin 0.98 is the emissivity of skin. Now you know, hey. <laughs> which is higher than rubber. Rubber is 0 0.095. So if you're wearing rubber, <laughs> very nice kind of wind. You can, you, can, uh, you can measure things like, uh, you know, you can point it at your motors and see how hot they're getting. Yeah. You yeah. can also point them, you can point them at the vents at your air conditioning and the vent in your ceiling and see what temperature it. Uh, it's no, I, I can totally see the justification for owning one of these now. Oh, it's it's really. I mean, they. Uh, I think it's really. Yeah, they're there with the vent use case, right? I think it's common uh, to find them in like IT data centers because you can just walk down and point them at the racks and figure mm -hmm. out which ones have the ventilation problem. Yeah. And the uh, and it's got. Yeah, uh, it doesn't show it very well in this photo, but it has a. Uh, when you when you squeeze the trigger, it actually shoots out an IR beam, so you know what you're pointing at. Oh. So I've, I've also seen these, uh, like you see them in the news every now and then, when the code enforcement comes out for animal cruel, cruelty, they'll stand outside the fence and point at where the dog is in in Dallas and say, "You're you're you're keeping your dog in too hot of a place. You got to take care of them." Because wow. hmm. they can read like for ten or twenty feet, I think, in some cases. Wow. And they come in different ranges. So there's like industrial high temp ones. This one had a pretty nice range, minus 58 to Fahrenheit to 1,112 Fahrenheit. So, yeah, it yeah, says not for humans, good. but then there on the thing, it says the skinny massivity is. <laughs> yeah, the micro center power supplies have gone up since I bought mine, which was probably several years ago. It's a hundred and yeah. quarter. 30 volts, five amps, it's regulated. I put the- Yeah, Banggood has, there. has uh, I always like the names. One is uh, Long Wee and the other is Inley. I always thought, you know, Long Wee or Shortly, you probably want the Long Wee version. But those, those kind of, they go on sale every so often too. And um, eh. I think I got mine on sale for like 40 something. Of course, there was more shipping because it's, you know, a pretty good size unit. But that's another place you could check. But you know, you don't necessarily need a constant current power supply. If you have one, it's a lot easier. But just a, you know, a power resistor, you know, figure out on a 12 volt supply, you're going to, you know, to get two amps, you need six ohms. Um, so what is that for times six, uh, 24 watts. Um, and you can, you know, just stick your circuit, you know, like on the ground side and measure it with a voltmeter. And you'll, you'll be sending two amps through your circuit and you can measure what the drop's gonna be. I'm gonna say goodbye to you guys. All right, we'll see you. Bye. Take care. The handy thing to have if you're doing, you know, working on a breadboard or something like that on a bench, where you always run the possibility of plugging things in wrong or shorting things out, it's awfully nice to have a power supply that kind of takes care of you in those circumstances. Here's here's one for fifty four dollars. Yep. Uh, free delivery if you have Prime, and it's zero to thirty volts, zero to ten amps. Yeah. So that's it's a switching, a which lead. means it's a little noisier, but that's a pretty wide range of yeah, uh, wattage. 
in, in 10 amps, man, you can blow up lots of stuff with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could you could charge your car battery in a, in a pinch if you needed to. So. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. Is that is that a a robot? Robot? What's what's called a hobbyist uh, must have? <laughs> I don't oh, know. one of these. Uh, yeah. John, we have, yeah. All right. we have all kinds of supply like that. About how you should spend your money. <laughs> Say it again, Dave. Mm -hmm. We have we all have ideas about how you should spend your money. Oh yeah, I can spend other people's money all day long and never fret about it. I'll tell you that. John, I, what I would say, your first thing that you got to do is get a voltmeter. Okay. Oh, I, I got that. I got a voltmeter. Okay, that's number one. The second yeah. thing you ought to get is a good soldering iron with a, if you can afford it, one with the adjustable heat. All right. Um, I have one. Uh, it's one kind of uh, bulky. Yeah. Oh, you mean like a, like an adjustable, like a feedback one, right? I, I have well, an open loop type. That's the best. Those are the best, but uh -huh. but minimum adjustable. All right. Mm -hmm. They have you can buy them um, one that's just a set set heat. You can buy one that's adjustable, but it's open loop, and you can buy one that's adjustable and it's closed loop. Each one goes up in money, as you can imagine. Uh, I would say uh, soldering on is actually we my son and I we use a lot, and yeah. I think the one we have is pretty cheap. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, you actually, know, a, a good open loop one is probably twenty five dollars. So they're it's not like they're really crazy expensive. All right. Mm, yeah. Even I would say the first yeah. piece of lab equipment that you ought to get is probably uh, that's a little light. For my taste, I prefer one that's more, more hefty than that. But if that works for you, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But I like one that's a little more. I mean, it says it's 65 watts. That should be way plenty. That's more than enough. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, that should be way plenty. That, that'll rip the traces off like your circuit 50. cards. Yeah. So, uh, but I don't know. I, is there's controls on the handle? Yeah. Okay. Okay. There that, is a control on the yeah, handle. That should be, that should be um, fine. And it, it has the. Uh, it comes with a little. It comes with the uh, solder uh, sucker and yeah. several see. tips and some tweezers and some yeah. solder and even has a sponge. Yeah. Just yeah. yeah. We have a. Take we have a pretty pretty yeah. pretty cheap one. <laughs> Not as good as that one. Yeah, that might be a good investment. And then, then the third thing I would, third thing it gets, you know, like everybody says, it's their opinion. Uh, the, if I only had one piece of lab equipment, it probably would be a nice power supply. Mm -hmm. It just makes doing things so easy. Yeah. You know, when you're working with your circuit and everything. And then and the fourth thing I would get. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, like the ones these guys were showing you. That'd be great. You have to be careful. Mm -hmm. Make sure you read the reviews because there are a few on the market that aren't uh, exactly safe. Okay, so yeah. you want to make sure that you don't read the guy says I took it apart and the ground wasn't there. You know that's that's a real common one that you see from China. Uh, but there's a, you shouldn't have to pay more than that to get a good one. You just mm -hmm. read the reviews. And uh, the fourth one would be one of those little eight dollar uh, logic analyzers. They're just they're worth their weight and gold, you know. So those would be the, you know, if you had those four pieces of gear, you'd probably be okay to uh, do most robot stuff. I yeah. uh, I yeah. my, uh, it's always nice to have an oscilloscope, but most yeah, I, uh, the logic analyzer. When do you guys need that? Okay, the logic analyzer will act like an oscilloscope for logic level. Oh, okay. Levels. I don't know if, if I have an oscilloscope. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I have an oscilloscope, I don't need a logic. Yeah. No, anytime you're doing I squared C, no, no, SPI. No, no, no. Okay. For eight bucks, go get one. And the reason why is because, like, if you're analyzing an I squared C bus, 
and you want to know what's really going on with an oscilloscope, first of all, it's a little bit tricky to catch it. But then when you finally caught it, you got to go in. Let's see, this is a one, and this is a zero, and this is a one. And the other one just says, you just sent 27 X. You know, it's wow. just so much, it's just so much easier that, you know, you want one. Interesting. Okay. That's the, uh, I've never I'm used sure one before. The one, show, and the one I'm talking right. about, you know, it looks like a little white box or a little tan box. I, I think. Oh, well, I, I bought the I squared C driver, this one, simply because I'm really trying to specialize right now. I'm trying to figure out how to do this master slave over I squared C. And this has a little display that actually shows you the signals themselves. But a logic analyzer is a more general purpose tool. Mm -hmm. I don't know where mine is right now. <laughs> That's kind of fun. Um, oh, if, really? you, uh, if you go look, I'll hold it up. This is sort of what yeah. they're talking about, one of those eight dollars. Nice wow, cool. yeah. Everybody has one. Okay, I'll get one. Too. Yeah, I mean, you can actually find these. <laughs> I don't have one. You can actually find one for less than five bucks if you really look around. <laughs> yeah, it's a mouse. I'll go get a, a cat cool. turd. Over that All thing. right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so. <laughs> on what you're looking, you're looking for in the thing. The, the the difference between what we just all held up there and the two or three hundred dollar one is those have lots of protection circuitry and buffers and other things and very nice stuff to make sure you don't blow up the thing. They're really based mostly on the same uh, basic uh, chip that's in the middle of all that stuff. So if, if you know, uh, we don't as hobbyists usually require the level of sophistication as the folks that are doing um, other things uh, that are for jitter and watching, make sure they don't blow up stuff and reverse voltage and all the other junk that can blow up for you. Cool. I think first one, uh, I'll pick a good, uh, a better iron, a, 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 a solar iron. That's something yeah, I Carl find the one we use is very cool. One, and I posted one just before that that's a 60 watt iron that I have that I picked up a little while ago. They use Hacko tips and it's a really nice iron as well. Hacko is a good one. Yeah, if you want to order a hacko, yeah. If you want to go, if you never want to buy an yeah. soldering iron, go hacko. There's also yeah. goop, which is a Japanese one, which is really good. One of the things that I learned from talking with a few people about soldering irons is that I used to think you'd want like a really low wattage one for, you know, for small things like like circuits, but it turns out that you actually want a fair number of watts. Like I've got mines at 85 to 120 watt, but it's temperature controlled. And so the temperature control basically says the tip is gonna maintain it. I think that's what you mean by closed loop, Doug, is that it's gonna maintain a certain temperature at the tip. And that temperature is just exactly what I want. And I'm using that and it, it heats up almost instantaneously and I can solder with a clean tip immediately without having to wait for the, the thing to heat up the actual pin or whatever. And I think that means you can do a quick solder before you heat up your board. Whereas if yeah. you had a 20 watt board, it would take a long time to heat up the pin. And everything mm -hmm. else gets real hot and then you start melting mm -hmm. things and all this other kind of stuff. You don't want it. You want enough juice. So when you stick it on there, it's hot, then you're off of it. And the yeah, trade exactly. is cool. and, and I could do all the pins on this in maybe about maybe 30 seconds. I just went zip, 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 all the way along, and, and it's fast. And so yeah, as, soon as, it, as soon as the tip touches the circuit card, right, that thermal load would bog it down and reduce the temperature. But the closed loop keeps it up at the high temperature. Yeah. yeah. Oh, John, you're you're still using send you his. I don't think he wants it anymore. What? Maybe Chris will just send you his, John. I don't think he wants it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I need my... Uh, well, no, no, I'm exactly the same, Mike. I've had to add more and more optical layers as the years have gone by. And sometimes, you know, it's like I make my best guess, you know. And then afterwards, pick it up and check it out with a loop. Nope, not yet. 
But I do a lot of crimping. I make a lot of crimp connectors. There you go. A welder. They're easier to make. <laughs> That's what there you need, John. Right there. Right in Germany. Read it in week. 240 watts, baby. 240 you know watts. Is. That's what you really need. You can melt steel you know with that. Yeah. This, they're a uh, solder socket. It feels good. Yeah. <laughs> and then something like this. Yeah. Guys, I think uh, I'll get a solder on <laughs> one thing at a time. But yeah, thanks, guys. So yeah, good, good. I'm, I'm, I'm all good now. <laughs> is is your solder lost, lost antimony or lead? The the what? Is your solder antimony or lead based? There, the old lead tin ones were much easier to solder uh, with the antimony substitute. You wasn't. mean the solder the solder wire? Yeah, what it's actually composed of. Um. Well, I, I see it's silverish with the call, <laughs> so I've, I have no should, idea what it is. It, It'll it, should be labeled. it should be labeled what it is. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, my son knows it better than me. Yeah, I, 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 I get it all. Too. It's the lead-based and the non-lead-based, and what you right. want is the lead-based. <laughs> there, yeah, we the lead ones work much better. Not lead-based, right? Lead-based is bad. Uh, well, yeah. well, only if you eat it. Oh. Off your solder no, board. Don't put it in your meal. Or so, um, inhale the smoke. Guys, what, what when I solder, the rest of the whole time you're soldering. So when, don't, when solder. Don't put it in your um, pipe or in your tin can. In, in, I, I used to see they have these vents, like a, like a sucking tube in the lab. But yeah. at home, I put it in my uh, garage. But my son, you already saw her just inside his bedroom. So I don't know how, how, oh, with a fan. Okay. Yeah. I guess fan plus a feedback, uh, feedback code is, is a good thing to make. I yeah, 3D printed yeah. one and put some charcoal filter on the thing and used a, nice. a, a, a fan I had laying around for my PCs. Right, uh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a little fan. Okay, cool. That's something. <laughs> I'm concerned about his health. <laughs> so, cool. Thanks, guys. You know, there's people, I'll tell you, John, there's people that'll talk to you that I, I've i been soldering 57,000 million years and that doesn't affect me at all. Well, it may or may not, but you might as well take some precaution um, because we know that it, it's not good for you, right? You might as well take right. some precaution. Yeah, it smells <laughs> bad, even outside the bedroom. <laughs> or, I don't know. Have they studied the effects of you know, antimony based yeah. solder? I mean, is it any better for you, or does it do something else to you? So, I, I, I don't know. It, it just they haven't studied that. Then well, the but. difference between uh, uh, lead based solder and, and non lead based non lead solder. I mean, I I'll be quite honest. I don't always use lead solder. Now, if I was making a part to sell, I would not. Right. But for my own personal stuff, I'd always use lead solder because it's like, on a scale of one to ten, it's probably a two. I mean, a, a ten, and the antimony one based ones are a one. I mean, they. I've actually had to, you know, just give up trying to unsolder something that was with antimony solder. It's so hard to get to the. You know, I, I, I was watching Bald Engineer and a couple of other people. And they have this really low temperature solder for unsoldering things. And literally, it remains molten longer. So you get the heat on the part longer. And so your other solder that's on there just kind of just, it allows you, gives you time to just dump a bunch of solder on one of these SMD chips and then literally pick the chip off the board. Mm -hmm. it, uh, and I saw them, I've been watching because I've got some SMD stuff I need to learn and some kits I need to put together. So I've been looking at a bunch of that and I'm like, I think I may need to get a small tube of that stuff to hang out and around because they made it look simple. And somehow I don't think it's going to be simple for me, but they made it look simple. They made it look simple. And they explained it because the low temp stuff will remain molten and hot longer than the stuff we're normally slaughtering with. Oh, well, yeah, but that's, uh, yeah, that's also like solder paste. Solder paste is like that. But yeah. 
So I'll get to learn all that here in a little bit. So I may be talking out my butt about all this stuff, but that's that's what I've seen so far, and I'm, I'll have some experience here in a, probably in the next month or so working on this stuff. Yeah. I'm fighting porting code right now. That's pissing me off. Nobody's done anything with Sager, right? An OS named by the name of Zephyr. Z P H O. Nope. Not here. Killing me over here. I should just stop trying to do contests to get free hardware. Make my <laughs> life probably a lot easier. We could suggest Control Alt Delete, but that probably wouldn't be too helpful. No, not really. I, I thank you. I thank you for the suggestion, though. But uh, not at this moment. Believe it or not, though, because I'm getting a linker error and some other weird shit, your suggestion, Carl, may not be far off the <laughs> weird stuff happening. When in doubt, cycle power. Yeah, it may not be far off the whole thing there. Or just leave it off. <laughs> Somebody raised a hand. Mr. Anderson, is that you? Yes, I have a question. I want to know why John has a mask on. Is that the makerspace? Yeah, that's He's correct. I actually was You're doing something. And that dang super spreader location, the makerspace. You know, actually, actually, it's nobody here in this room. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> but no, the reason why is because, yeah, to get on this, so I say here to achieve that. But, well, I. I have something to show you all. So as I was surfing the web, I found another interesting thing. So let me see if I can click a uh, uh, window. And hopefully I'll click on the right one. So, so there's uh, another thing you could print for a real counter that looks interesting. So, so if you all want to print, there's that. And then there was one other thing that I saw. So let me see if I can stop and show you the other one. Okay. Was that one on Thingiverse, John? Uh, that was, uh, yeah, I think it was. <laughs> I have to reclick, but. Oh, um, you don't have to. Okay. And then the other thing was this, which might be interesting for whoever wants to print little robots for kids type thing. So that one definitely was more interesting. Can you scroll down a little bit, yeah, John? That's what I'm working on. So that you can print all these real plastic parts and it looks sort of interesting. And it's open source. So and talks about cables. So there's how to print parts. And then there's software to talk about. So, and then, yeah, so it looks like a nice little article. And the main thing is the fact that you can print the parts <laughs> and it's interlockable. So I thought that was interesting. You can see where it says plug. So, and then there's, yeah, <laughs> and there's the rocks for how to make it rock. So I thought, yeah, Murray will find that interesting. Most things. So that's the other thing I wanted to show. And then on the real encoder, yeah, it was on Thingiverse. So I can, I'll paste the uh, actual uh, link thing for it. So, as I said, that was a little bit of interest. Very nice. Okay, let's see. I have 
How far, uh, how far have we made it around the table? Have we missed anyone yet? No, I've been chatting all along and commenting on everybody. I'm good. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. All right. Hey, well, if there's nothing else, then maybe we uh, maybe we should call it an evening and catch up next Tuesday night. Don't forget, uh, if you're a game volunteer for Saturday, help Kareem. Otherwise, uh, catch you next Tuesday night. Okay. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.